Are you in college? The Thomistic Institute Study Abroad program is now accepting applications for the spring semester of 2024. This unique and exciting study abroad program offers you the opportunity to spend a semester in Rome at the Dominican Order's Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. You'll study the ancient and medieval intellectual tradition of Rome, live with like-minded young men and women steps from the Colosseum, and participate in weekly cultural and intellectual events, regular day trips, and multi-day excursions. To learn more about this life-changing opportunity, go to ThomisticInstitute.org slash Rome. That's ThomisticInstitute.org slash Rome. Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. We'll begin with John 3.16 and a prayer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Let us pray. O loving Father, we give you thanks and praise that you have given us your own Son to show us the depths of your love for us. We ask you now to pour forth his Spirit upon us, that we may know how we are called to be beloved in the beloved Son. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. John 3.16 has a special place in many Christian hearts, and it certainly had a special place in the heart of St. Thomas Aquinas. In the third part of his Summa, he has 59 questions with all sorts of articles about Jesus Christ, our Savior. And in the very first question in Article 2, He uses John 3.16 as a special authority for uh, what he wants to discuss, and that is whether it was necessary for the restoration of the human race that the Word should become incarnate. Okay, so in terms of our salvation, our restoration, was it necessary? And so he uses this in the said contra, or but against this. He says, what frees the human race from perdition is necessary for the salvation of man. But the mystery of the incarnation is such, according to John 3, God so loved the world as as to give his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but may have everlasting life. St. Thomas concludes, Therefore, it was necessary for man's salvation that God should become incarnate. Now, St. Thomas goes on to give all sorts of theological explanations there in that article, but I'd like to bounce around in terms of different texts from St. Thomas for us to appreciate it, because we need to know God's love in our lives. There are various competing loves, various things in the world that compete for our love and response. And of all things, we in the Christian faith can know about God's love for us because he sent his own son, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered, died, and rose for our salvation So that way we, filled with his spirit, may go back to the Father, that we may have an everlasting happiness. And so this is where, in terms of just being able to see that St. Thomas Aquinas is a passionate theologian. Sometimes people think of St. Thomas as being particularly dry or so intellectual that he doesn't really have a heart. Oh, St. Thomas had a heart. He would weep during Mass. He would weep at Compline. He uh, he dedicated his whole life to be able to uh, preach the good news of Jesus Christ. He had a heart. He was a passionate theologian. And again, he had a special place for John 3.16. In his commentary on John, when he goes to John 3.16, he says this, Here we should note that the cause of all our good is the Lord and divine love. For to love is, properly speaking, to will good to someone. Okay, let's just think about that for a moment, because that's a really basic, um, in a sense, Aristotelian point. Uh, To love someone is to will good for that person. Uh, Like, uh, uh, I love love pizza, 
all right? I love pizza, right? I love a sunny day. I don't, in that kind of love, will good to the pizza. I don't will good to the sunny day. This particular type of love is a love of friendship. And St. Thomas Aquinas is famous, actually, in terms of thinking about the different kinds of love, to say that God loves us in a way that calls us to his friendship. Okay? Friendship. And so this is where, in terms of just considering the power of God's love in our life, that God wants to lift us up to know that we are loved no matter what we have done in our lives, no matter what sins we have committed, no matter how much other people have hurt us through their sinfulness, that God is good. Okay? So he wants us to know that we're called to his love. And every single good thing that we experience, every single good thing that we experience comes from the divine love. All right, so again, for, to love is, properly speaking, to will good to someone, okay? God loves us, and so he wants to give us one good thing after another. Uh, God's love is the cause of the good of nature. St. Thomas quotes the Book of Wisdom, you love everything which exists. It's also the cause of good, which is grace. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and so I have drawn you through grace. And then it's because of his great love that he gives us the good of glory. So he shows this in terms of these three ways. The three ways, again, are nature, grace, and glory. All right, let's think about this. We experience all sorts of good things. Some good things that we experience are on the natural level, the level of nature. So uh, I was born into the world. Uh, uh, I have a human nature. Uh, uh, I interact with natural things. Okay? You can look at the beautiful mountains. You can look at the sky in terms of all different things of nature. Every human being has a human nature. Right? So God is the creator of all good things. And, the, and many of these good things here on this earth are physical, tangible, material. Uh, and then there are also certain things that are spiritual and, or intellectual, and they too are things of nature. Okay? So like the human soul, the human soul and the human body together are, make up one human person. God made them both. And both then are about human nature. Every good thing that we have by nature comes from God. Everybody. Now, I was not born a Catholic. I was reborn a Catholic Christian about two weeks after I was born. All right? So um, not only is God the good of things of nature, he's also the good creator um, who gives us a recreation by grace. And that's where, in terms of calling us to friendship, that during this life on earth, we're called to experience the divine love on a different level, the level of grace, the level of being baptized Christians, being in, the, uh, the, uh, in Christ himself, in the church. And then God wants us to know that he has a plan for us. So not only is it in terms of nature and then grace, but there's glory. Okay, so glory is heaven. Notice that you can't go to heaven, that glory of heaven, unless you have grace, and you can't have grace unless you have a nature that is capable of receiving God. Okay, trees and mountains, uh, dogs, squirrels, okay, uh, these things have nature, but they don't have a nature that is capable of God a rational nature, a nature that, in the proper sense, can think and can love. God has made this human nature out of its own generosity in order for, during this life on earth, for us to be graced, and so that way we can be prepared to enter into the glory of heaven. Now, St. Thomas, in treating this verse, John 3.16, says, 
uh, that uh, from, from four reasons, this love of God is the greatest. One, from the person of the one loving, because God loves immeasurably. All right? So this is where, in terms of God is not stingy. He's not stingy. God is the giver of all good things. And he has absolutely no need. Okay? So this is where I may give you something, but you may think, well, what's that? why is he doing that? Okay? Because actually, we um, have particular motivations that are outside of us. God doesn't need anything. And he can then love without measure. He can pour out his love on the worst sinner. Not because the sinner deserves it, but because of who he is. He is love. Second one, so after the person, the one loving, because God loves immeasurably, from the condition of the one loved. So, and that is from Romans 5, God shows his love for us because while we are still sinners, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. And this is where in terms of just think about how once God's love comes to us who are sinners, we then can see that we who were enemies were made God's friends by the grace of Christ. Third, love is shown through gifts. Okay, so uh, people sometimes talk about love languages. Well, one of the love languages is giving a gift. God, God speaks our language. And so, you know, I like gifts. Come on, you like gifts. Everybody is, as long as it's given by the, by the right someone. Okay, you don't, want a, you don't want a gift from someone who, again, may manipulate you or something. Or you, know, you don't want a bad gift. God always has uh, goodness in mind. He never does anything evil. And so you need to think about how he gives because of who he is. And he gives us all good things, but of all good things, it's especially his son. Okay. St. Catherine of Siena uh, prays, what more could you have given me than the gift of your very self? What more could you have given me than the gift of your very self? And it's like, oh, you know, God wasn't satisfied in terms of, oh, here's a nice day for you. He gives us himself. And the fourth one, the greatness of the fruit or effect of what he gave us, eternal life through the son's death, on a cross. So in terms of the effect of this gift that the Father gives is our eternal life. Eternal life which begins now by grace and then will yield into glory. Okay, it's like a seed that's planted in our soul. That grace is like a seed. And then, uh, and then at the resurrection, uh, in terms of the, the glory of the, of the resurrection uh, after our death, that fullness, okay, the glory of eternal life. Now, St. Thomas treats John 3, 16 in various places. Another place would be he preached on the Apostles' Creed. And he has a special emphasis on this when he go, goes to who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, again, in terms of you think about the incarnation, the word was made flesh through Mary, you know, her theon, her yes. Well, St. Thomas sees that our theological virtues so faith, hope, and charity are infused in us by God, okay, during this life of grace, and that when we meditate on this wonder of the incarnation, that the Son of God came to us because the Father has so much loved us, then our own charity is enkindled. So St. Thomas says, there's no proof of divine charity so clear as that God, the creator of all things, is made a creature that our Lord has become our brother, and that the Son of God is made the Son of Man. For God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, John 3. Therefore, upon consideration of this, our love for God ought to be reignited and burst into flame. Okay? So this is where, in terms of thinking about it, you can't love that which you do not know. Okay? You can't love that which you do not know. And then to be able to see that as thinkers, as made to the image of God, who is all-knowing, we then can know something of who God is and of who we are and the great dignity that we're called. Sometimes people will tell us that we're junk, okay? That basically um, there are lots of people who deny the immortal, immaterial soul. 
uh, and that our body uh, is just simply ourselves, and, and there's, no, there's no immaterial spiritual component to us, and then we fall apart and die, and then decompose. Okay, this is what, um, uh, what various people say, and you just think, oh, okay, the Christian vision is radically different. Okay, the Christian vision is that we are made by God in his image, he has a plan for our happiness, and that he has shown us the, his love, especially in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Right? So then, once we know this by faith, we can love him. We're made free to love him. And, and this is where, in terms of that the saints show us how to love, especially when we suffer. Okay? That, that because, because the world, in different ways, is a hard place. And we're made for heaven. So, St. Thomas continues in his sermon conferences on the Apostles' Creed, this induces us to keep our souls pure. Our nature was exalted and ennobled by its union with God to the extent of being assumed into union with the divine person. So what St. Thomas does is he goes back and he says, well, look at what God did for us. You have the incarnation. God took our human nature into his own person. Okay, so St. Thomas continu continues, Indeed, after the incarnation, the angel would not permit St. John to adore him, although he allowed this to be done even before by even the greatest patriarchs. The so Revelation chapter 22. Uh, therefore, one who reflects on this exaltation of his nature and is ever conscious of it should scorn to cheapen and lower himself and his nature by sin. Thus, St. Peter says, by these he has given us most great and precious promises, that by them you may be made partakers of the divine nature, fleeing the corruption of that concupiscence which is in the world. St. Thomas has a vision of deification, that following upon 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, that we are made partakers of the divine nature, that we can flee the corruption of this world and know that we're called to share in who God is. St. Thomas continues, finally, by consideration of all this, our desire to come to Christ is intensified. All right, so this is where in terms of thinking about, well, where, where should we go? What do we, what do we do? Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Um, and St. Thomas, uh, in the culture of his day, you think about someone great could be called a king. Okay, so in terms of a, a great king. So he says, if the king had a brother who was away from him a long distance, that brother would desire to come to the king to see, to be with him, and to abide with him. So also Christ is our brother, and we should desire to be with him and to be united to him. The Apostle Paul desired to be dissolved and be with Christ. And it is this desire which grows in us as we meditate upon the incarnation of Christ. Okay? So this is where in terms of thinking about God's love in the incarnation, it's like, oh, yes! So what do we do? We go to Jesus. Okay? That, that we want to be close to him, that we never want to be separated from him. Now, before we have questions and answers, I want us to continue to think about this in a few different directions. All right? uh, one is how God is love, then the incarnation as the supreme act of love, and then the word breathing forth love, how the Holy Spirit, okay, so in a particular way, the Holy Spirit can be called God's love, is active in Christ and in the church. Okay, so I'd like for us to consider this. 1 John 4 says, God is love. Now, let's go back to love. Love is an action that proceeds from the will. Okay, so the will is this intellectual desire and appetite uh, uh, for some good. And, uh, and God, uh, who is utterly simple, has a divine will. Okay, God, who is utterly simple, has a divine will. Now, what do I mean by utterly simple? Um, for everything in creation, there is a composition. Uh, we're made up of parts, okay? God doesn't have parts. In fact, his very essence is his act of existence. Okay? 
So in terms of ipsum esse per se subsistence, the very act of existing, subsisting through itself. Okay? God um, uh, is, is this um, that is beyond all creaturely categories. And so in terms of his existence, he, um, he, his essence is his act of existence, and so his will, uh, uh, his intellect, all these, um, what for us, they are things within us, that's all God. And this is where, in terms of God is love, he has, because he is, an eternal act, an eternal act of being. Right? And that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From all eternity, the Father has generated the Son, and the Holy Spirit has proceeded. So it's one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in an ineffable communion of love. Okay, so each of them is God, whole and entire. Okay, because and because God doesn't have parts. Okay, uh, these are not modes of God. These are three persons in relation to one another. And that the Holy Spirit, in a special way, can be called love. Okay, so in terms of the Father loving the Son, uh, with the Holy Spirit. Saint Thomas wrote a work called the Compendium of Theology, and for those who may be intimidated by the Summa of Theology, I highly recommend the Compendium of Theology. It was written for his companion Reginald of Paperno. And uh, he didn't finish it, but he did finish that first part on faith. So it was supposed to be faith, hope, and charity. But what he did in terms of finishing it on faith, he said that there were these two main teachings of faith, the Trinity and the Incarnation. And he organized all the matters of the Catholic faith based upon these two things, the two principles, two principal articles of faith. And you, rather than having question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, it's like a catechism, okay? It just, it just, you just kind of naturally go through reading it, paragraph by paragraph. Listen to this paragraph from the compendium. Just as God's understanding is his existence, so likewise is his love. Accordingly, God does not love himself by any act that is over and above his essence, but he loves himself by his very essence. Since God loves himself for the reason that he is in himself as the beloved and the lover, God the Beloved is not in God the Lover in any accidental fashion, in the way that the objects of our love are in us who love them, that is, accidentally. Okay, so in terms of loving pizza, if I love pizza, okay, then the idea uh, of pizza is within me, and, it, and it's, but I cannot will good to pizza, okay? But pizza can get inside us, and we feel good. <laughs> okay? So this is where, in terms of, of thinking about how God is different from pizza, um, uh, so, uh, God is substantially in himself as beloved and lover, okay? So, uh, the Son is in the Father. Therefore, the Holy Spirit, who represents the divine love to us, is not something accidental in God, but subsists in the divine essence, just as the Father and the Son do. And so, in the rule of Catholic faith, he is exhibited as no less worthy of adoration and glorification than the Father and the Son are. Right now, let's think about this again in terms of God's perspective, which is so different from ours. Okay, my ways are not your ways, God says. We see things because they are. God sees things and they come to be. Okay, so when God wills, okay, because not only because God wills in a way to make things occur, to have creation that's different from Himself. He's the creator, creation. He has a plan, okay? So a plan. Uh, and then he wills things to, he sees things, and he makes them be. For us, we love things that are good, okay? So in terms of, uh, yeah, have a piece of pizza, yeah, I, it's good, okay? I, I love it because it's good, okay? Or I love my friend uh, because of the goodness there. God's love makes the goodness. God doesn't react. Okay? So this is where, um, uh, this is different from many modern ways of thinking. Uh, the classical approach, and St. Thomas articulates it most beautifully, 
is that God is not dependent upon anything in the world. Rather, the world is radically, radically dependent upon God. And so God sees things and they come to be. He loves things and they become good. Okay? He doesn't love things because they are good. He's good and so he loves and things come to be good because he loves. All right? So it's a radical difference. Um, so uh, God does not merit. Uh, we don't say, good job, God, okay, in terms of uh, uh, giving God a reward. He doesn't accrue to himself. We need to get thanks. Okay? We need. God doesn't need. Right? Now, Father Michael Dodds is a Dominican friar from the province of the Most Holy Name of Jesus uh, and teaches in Berkeley, California. He has a beautiful book called The Unchanging God of Love. Father Dodds writes, In Aquinas' theology, God acts not out of desire for an end he has yet to attain, but out of love for an end he eternally and unchangingly possesses an infinite fullness, the end of his own unbounded goodness. In this, he is different from every created agent. So agent is just a fancy way of saying anybody who does something, or anything that does something. And so God does things because of who he is. Okay, all the time. Uh, in the Summa Contra Gentiles, book four, St. Thomas writes about matters of faith, and he says, the goodness of God is his reason for willing that other things be, and that by his will he produces things in being. The love, then, by which he loves his own goodness is the cause of the creation of things. All right, so because he loves himself, he um, also chooses to make creation. Okay, so it's because of who he is. He's all good. Now, the incarnation is the most wonderful act of God. So, uh, now let's think about this in terms of, of uh, celebrations. Some uh, people will say that St. Thomas Aquinas says that the reason why we have the incarnation is because of human sin. All right, so that various theologians have talked about the Incarnation, and some people will characterize Thomas' theology as, well, the reason why God became incarnate is because the human race sinned. That's St. Thomas' position. Um, that's not quite it. All right? So first off, from the human point of view, he says that God could have done anything that he wanted, uh, but when we read Scripture, it does say that God beca became man, because of sin. But more fundamentally, it's because of who God is. Father John Mark Iboalsi is a friar from the Dominican province of St. Joseph the Worker, Nigeria. And he recently defended his beautiful doctoral dissertation at the Pontifical Faculty of the Dominican House of Studies titled Caritas Dei in Cruce Christi, so the charity of God in Christ's cross, Thomas Aquinas and the mystery of human redemption. Father Ibo Alessi writes, The remedy for sin is an effect and not a cause of God's ordination. This elucidation is often neglected or unknown by those who misconstrue Aquinas' positing remission of sin as the main motive of the Incarnation. Instead, Aquinas distinguishes between the fittingness of the Incarnation on the part of God, which focuses on the perfection of God, especially divine love, and the fittingness of the Incarnation on our part as humans, which focuses on the remedy for sin. Okay, and then later, Father Ibo Asi says, For Aquinas, the motive of God's action is always intrinsic, since God, as pure act, is not actuated by something extrinsic to his being. Thus, the divine will by which God ordains things is not moved by something outside of God, but by the divine law, which is the principal act of the divine will. So this is where, in terms of, of thinking about why does God do things, it's because of who he is. And who is he? Love. All right? So this is where, in terms of, of considering the beauty of that, uh, Father Iba Asi writes, God's love is not elicited by something outside of God. The divine love is the primary reason for the incarnation. It is the cause of salvation. Why are we saved? Because God loves us. In the Summa Contra Gentiles, book four, among divine works, this most especially exceeds the reason. 
For nothing can be thought of which is more marvelous than this divine accomplishment that the true God, the Son of God, should become true man. Okay, again, this is mind-blowing. Okay, so there are certain truths that can be understood by reason, but there are other truths that are still true, but they are revealed to us by God, and we hold them by faith. All right, so in terms of the life of grace, that we need to exercise acts of faith to receive God revealing himself and his plan. And so this is where, in terms of, oh, could you just come to this on your own in terms of your own philosophical reasoning? No. It's something that God revealed. God did it. Why? Because he is love. All right. Now, for this last part, before we have questions and answers, I'd like for us to consider uh, the word breathing forth love. Jesus is the Word made flesh. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. He is the beloved Son. Now, from all eternity, the Father begot the Son. And you just think about the love that is there because of who God is. He is love. And, uh, and so then to be able to see that, that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is this eternal, divine communion of love, and that the Holy Spirit then uh, is uh, given to us here in creation, in our recreation, as a, as a mission okay, that he is sent in order for us to be united to Christ. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas looks at this very carefully. And he sees that when the word was made flesh, okay, Jesus, that not only do you have the word there, but because the word is breathing forth love, okay, this is where in terms of you, you think about uh, you, when you speak, you have not only a word, but a breath that comes. Um, so in terms of God, the word and the Holy Spirit are always together. And so when the word was made flesh, the Holy Spirit Filled Jesus' soul. Okay, because he has a soul. You have a soul. He has a soul. He took upon himself our complete human nature in order to save us. And so this is where, in terms of the Holy Spirit, comes to Jesus at that first moment of conception within Our Lady's womb and fills his soul to such a wonderful ex extent that he is full of grace and truth. He becomes the head over the church, the body. He becomes the vine for us who are branches. You don't have a branch that is having life without being connected to the, to the vine. Okay? You don't have a, a body that's alive without being connected to the head. Well, Jesus is the one who gives us this life it's the life of the Spirit. You know, you think about the, the Spirit is Lord and giver of life. So this is where in terms of love, okay, the love of the incarnation, it's like, oh, it's not just about Jesus, it's about the Holy Spirit too. Exactly. That Jesus, in coming to us, wants us to be filled with the grace of the Spirit. So in question 43 of the first part of the Summa, Article 5, St. Thomas says, the soul is made like God by grace. Hence, for a divine person to be sent to anyone by grace, there must needs be a likening of the soul to the divine person who was sent by some gift of grace. Because the Holy Spirit is love, the soul is assimilated to the Holy Spirit by the gift of charity. Hence, the mission of the Holy Spirit is according to the mode of charity, whereas the Son is the word, not any sort of word, but one who breathes forth love. Hence, Augustine says in, on the Trinity, Book 9, the word we speak of is knowledge with love. Thus the Son is sent not in accordance with every and any kind of intellectual perfection, but according to the intellectual illumination which breaks forth into the affection of love. As is said in John 6, everyone that has heard from the Father has learned comes to me. In, psalm, in the psalm, in my meditation, a fire shall flame forth. Remember, St. Thomas Aquinas, a passionate theologian. He wants us to be passionate Christians. And it's really much easier to love when you know that you're loved. It's really much easier to, 
to love when you know that you are loved. Okay? So, Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. That the Holy Spirit then, because um, Jesus did not want to leave us orphans, the Holy Spirit then fills us with his grace, and so that way we may have the love of God at work in us. The love of God at work in us. That we then are loved by God and can return that love. Summa Gentiles, Gentiles Book 4 Sacred scripture is accustomed to attributing every grace to the Holy Spirit, for what is graciously given seems bestowed by the, lover, by the love of the giver. But no greater gift has been bestowed on man than union with God in person. What's that union with God in person? Jesus. Okay? Because he took upon himself the, our human nature in his own person. Okay? So, and that the Holy Spirit then uh, shows us this. Okay? The, the Holy Spirit is the one, um, uh, in terms of, again, you think about how, how, uh, how the conception occurred because the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, also in Book 4 of the Summa Contra Gentile, St. Thomas says, Moreover, God manifestly loves in the greatest degree those whom he has made lovers of himself through the Holy Spirit, for he would not confer so great a good except by loving us. Hence, we read in Proverbs 8, from the person of God, I love those who love me. Not as though we had loved God, but because he first loved us, as we read in 1 John. St. Thomas has a special love for this 1 John 4, that he first loved us. Okay. Because, think about the life of grace. God gives us grace, gives us love, because of who he is. Okay? God loves us, not because of, of who we are, but because of who he is. That's grace. It's a great gift. Therefore, by the Holy Spirit, not only is God in us, but we are also in God. We read in 1 John, He who abides in charity abides in God and God in him. And this is that we know, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now, St. Thomas continues. Remember I said that St. Thomas is famous in theology concerning love? That to stress again and again that the love that God loves us is friendship. Okay? And you think that God loves us, He wants us to be His friends. Okay? And so St. Thomas says this is the proper mark of friendship that one reveals his secrets to his friend. Okay? So if you have, uh, if you have a particular secret, okay, uh, are you going to entrust this to a stranger? Going to entrust, to entrust this to an enemy? You're going to have someone who, in a sense, shares your own heart. Okay? And you just think, oh, right? Now, this is what happens for us. For since charity unites affections and makes it, as it were, one heart of two, one seems not to have dismissed from his heart that which he reveals to a friend. Okay? So, in a sense, if you tell your secret to a friend, it hasn't left your heart. Uh, and Jesus does that for us. I will not call you servants, be, uh, but friends, because all things whatsoever I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. Okay, so the Son, every, the, every, the Father has revealed all things to the Son, and the Son then reveals the secrets of his heart, because he's joined us to himself by his love, and we've become into the body, we've entered into the body of Christ. It's as if we're all Christ because of the unique incarnation that the church is called to participate in Christ himself. Therefore, since by the Holy Spirit we are established as friends of God, fittingly enough it is by the Holy Spirit that we are said to receive the revelation of the divine mysteries. Hence the apostle says, 1 Corinthians 2, it is written that eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared for them that love him. But to us, God has revealed them by his spirit. St. Thomas says, in terms of friendship again, one thing that's, uh, that's proper about friendship is that you want to converse with a friend. You want to be with a friend and talk with a friend. Okay? When you have a really good friend, you want to talk with a person. right? Well, that's what God does in his love for us. Um, St. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, our conversation, or sometimes translated as our citizenship, is in heaven. 
our way of being, our way of talking is in heaven. We're, we're meant to have this kind of a heavenly discourse, a heavenly life here upon this earth. Since, therefore, the Holy Spirit makes us lovers of God, we are in consequence established by the Holy Spirit as contemplators of God. Sometimes people think that they can't, uh, because they can't do certain things in life, then they're useless and that, you know, they, they, they get down on themselves. Think about God. God really wants you to think about him. God wants you to know how much you are loved by him and that then your life matters to him. Look at the cross of Jesus Christ. If you ever wonder, does your life matter? Look at the cross of Jesus and know the love of God at work. Um, all right, and then St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but we all beholding the glory of the Lord with open face are transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. That we are called in this deification to know that God is calling us higher, higher, higher in terms of experiencing his love. And then to be able to take delight. It's a property of friendship also that one take delight in a friend's presence, rejoice in his words and deeds, and find in him security against all anxieties. Okay, and so it's especially in our sorrows that we hasten to our friends for consolation. When you get really upset, don't you want to turn to a friend? God, in the incarnation, is there for us. Okay, to, to let us know, do not be afraid. The Holy Spirit constitutes us God's friends and makes him dwell in us and us dwell in him. Uh, that In the Holy Spirit, we are to have joy in God and security against all the world's adversities and insults. So we read in the psalm, Restore unto me the joy of our salvation and strengthen me with your lordly spirit. And Romans 14, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but justice and peace and joy in the spirit. Similarly, too, it's proper to friendship to consent to a friend in what he wills. Of course, the will of God is set forth for us by his precepts. Okay, so this is where, um, when you have a good friend and there's something really important, the friend knows this is what you need to do. It's like, oh, okay. Well, God is our ultimate friend who tells us at times what we need to do. There are precepts, commandments. Okay, don't do that. Okay, it's simple. Okay, you think of something evil, don't do that. Um, think of something good, do that. It's good for you. Um, therefore, it belongs to the love by which we love God that we fulfill his commandments. Uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus says that, John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. And of all commandments, what's the chief commandment? Love. Hence, since we are established as God's lovers by the Holy Spirit, by him too, we are in a way driven to fulfill the precepts of God. Right, right now, we're in the season of Lent. And I'd like to close this presentation before we have the questions answers discussion with St. Thomas's first reason for why we have the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so you know, we are called to pick up our cross and follow Jesus who has gone before us to suffer, die, and rise from the dead. Listen to what St. Thomas says in the third part, question 46, article 3. Among means to an end, that one is the more suitable, whereby the various concurring means employed are themselves helpful to such an end. Okay? But in this, that man was delivered by Christ's passion, many other things besides deliverance from sin concurred for man's salvation. In the first place, man knows thereby how much God loves him, and is thereby stirred to love him in return. And herein lies the perfection of human salvation. Hence the apostle says, Romans 5, God commends his charity towards us, for yet, as we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so you just think that in terms of God wants us to know that we are saved by his love, by his love, and so that the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ shows us in a most wondrous way that God, who cannot suffer in himself, took upon our frail flesh and a uh, and allowed the crucifixion to occur, so that way we may know how we're loved, and that we're called out of this world into the glory of heaven. All right, so we have time now for questions and answers. Yes. So you made a statement earlier on when you said, God is not directed by anything external to himself. So in the Old Testament, though, there's a lot of cases like with the story of Adam and Eve, 
after they eat the fruit, a fruit from the tree they were immediately cast out of the garden. You're right. So is that an action based on something external to him since it's something that people committed? Right. So the question is, in terms of, of how if God doesn't act because of external stimuli, well, go to the Bible, okay, the Old Testament. Well, actually, begin in Genesis. Uh, doesn't God react to, say, what Adam and Eve do? Uh, okay. And then you can think about, well, doesn't God pay attention to my prayers? Uh, if, and if you just took it to say, well, since God doesn't act because of external stimuli, why am I praying? Why am I taking this time? Okay. God can take everything into account. So this is where, in terms of the wonder of something existing that's not God, creation. Okay? So this is where God, in his utter generosity, made things out of nothing, and he doesn't need to, uh, um, to react to anything, because he has no need. And from all eternity, okay, because so, so in God, um, God doesn't have in himself past, present, and future, but he knows, and his ordinance includes every detail in past, present, and future in creation, because creation certainly does have a past, a present, and a future. Okay? So that's very evident, okay, in terms of uh, how, oh, I'm here today, I... I was somewhere else yesterday. I will be somewhere else. Okay, so our, our whole, this is time. God is eternal. So this is where, in terms of, he holds everything in time. And he um, knows uh, all things. All things are present to him. And they're present to him in his way, in his eternal knowledge. So that way, he uh, is um, he's sustaining everything that exists uh, so that you have things that happen um, by his own plan. Okay? And that's where, in terms of, uh, uh, you think, oh, okay, so there are certain things that are done. Okay? You think about all well, the sacraments. Uh, I baptize you in the name of the... You know, when you have a minister of baptism, um, someone was not baptized. And then after baptism, that person is baptized. Well, um, does something happen in that sacrament? Yes. Why? Because God uses the sacrament of baptism for his grace. Okay? You think, oh, yeah. But, but every single detail, every single action is eternally present to God. And God is um, different. Okay? And this is where it's like, oh, this is really different from my experiences. Yes, it really is. And, uh, and modern theologies, some various modern theologies, get into lots of problems because they don't want to emphasize God's difference. They, want to, they think it's more meaningful for God to react, okay? for God to, oh, uh, take risks. Okay? Isn't that exciting, for God to take a risk? That exciting. It seems absurd. All right, so... Um, so this is where, in terms of the, just the difference between our experience of time and God, okay? And you think about, um, uh, about the radical nature of this, and it's like, oh, wow. Right? So it's very difficult to consider, but I think it's true. And I think, um, I think various kinds of modern ways of putting God into a creaturely realm, uh, and also not just modern, but... but, um, but uh, but various people want to, to make God act as everything else acts and to put God in a creaturely category. God bursts all categories. That's what, that's what true love does. Question? Um, do you think the incarnation would have still happened had there not been originals? Great. So the question is, would the incarnation... Would incarnation would have happened if there had been no original sin? Saint Thomas, when he, that question is asked, uh, uh, says, "Well, let's look at the record of salvation, and that is the Bible tells us that it happened because of original sin. Could God have done it? Yes, He could have done it without original sin. And God is love, 
but um, we live in this world. And so St. Thomas is more interested in this world, and by the way, this world was fallen. Okay, so this is where uh, you have other theologians with other responses, it's true, but um, from God's point of view, he is love, and the prime motive, well, actually the only motivation uh, of anything is himself, and he's love, okay? Uh, but there's a givenness about our world, okay? So could God have done it? He could have, without original sin, okay, because of who he is. But um, in, in the Bible, St. Thomas sees that the human part of it is because of our sinfulness. Okay, so that's where it's, it's like God does everything because of who he is. And then in terms of, of seeing that, as a matter of fact, the world is fallen. Yep. Yes? So, um, if God doesn't have any parts, yep. that means every single thing that we attribute to him, his will, his grace, his love, that's all just us kind of throwing words at him? Great. So the question is, in terms of, since God doesn't have any parts, when we say of different things of God, uh, is that just throwing words at him? Okay, so in terms of God's will, God's intellect, God's will, God's power, uh, God's love, all of those words actually describe the reality of who God is. It, for us, we need multiple words. We need a lot of words, actually, to be able to, um, to look at God from different directions because of, how, of who God is. But then we just need to say, oh, okay. Um, for us, there is a real way of naming uh, that, uh, that is taken up by God and allows us to name something of who he is, particularly because of, of uh, what's called... Um, the, um, sorry, particularly because God is not made of parts. God is not material. God is not, and, and so there's this utter simplicity. So it's a purification of our language uh, that, uh, uh, that helps us, recognizing that we falter, that we murmur, uh, um, but at the same time, there's something true, okay? And that's where, in terms of having our language more and more purified, because there's a truth there that all of our language, in some sense, falters, but there's but we can actually say certain things. So how do we get our language closer and closer to God? So the question is, well, how can we get our language closer and closer to who God is? And that is to be purified. Okay, so to be uh, to have our lives more and more purified, and then to see how God wants us to know Him. So this is where, in terms of, of thinking about, okay, is um, my experience of human beings is that we're mixed bags. Okay, that we that uh, uh, that we you know we, uh, sometimes people <laughs> do, sometimes people do bad things. Just sometimes people do really bad things. Um, we need to have this purification because say, even God, we say God is good, and we really mean that. Okay, so you know, Jesus, when the rich young man comes to him, uh, good teacher, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only one is good. Okay, he doesn't say, don't, don't call me good. He says, why do you call me good? Um, that even in terms of goodness, it's like, oh, God is better than pizza. You know, <laughs> uh, God, God is better then all uh, God is better than a billion dollars. God is better. God is better than the whole universe. God is better than all creation. In fact, God is subsisting goodness. And it's like, okay, well, God says something. Okay, he, he's not just simply the cause of all good things, but he's actually good in himself. He's good, simply speaking. He's the good. And, and so this is where, in terms of our language, then can be purified because um, of certain things in philosophy that can help us, but most especially divine revelation, okay? The grace 
of being purified and to be able to have an experience of God and to be able to, to say things that would be, um, that, 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 that God wants to hear. And, th- and this is where in terms of thanking God, praising God, adoration, that, 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 um, that, that can be really beautiful because God loves us and for some reason he made this creation and so our greatest dignity is to be able to know God, to love God, and to serve God. Okay, in terms of just thinking about how th- th- this is this is what we're all about. All right, so how about we pray, Lord, be and I give you a blessing. So, so glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. So the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. May the peace and blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you, may you forever. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.thomisticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.